And a very, very warm welcome to all of you who are participating here today with us for uh, a very interesting webinar. On behalf of all of us, Louisa, Dr. Louisa Rodericks, an old and dear friend of the Museum Society and of several of us who are here this evening and a colleague of many of us as well, a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Louisa, on behalf of the chairman and the trustees of the CSMVS, on behalf of the executive committee of the Museum Society, on behalf of our beloved director general, Mr. Sabiasachi Mukherjee, and on my own behalf, I'm really delighted that you accepted the offer of the Godridge Archives, to, who are our co-hosts this evening, to join us and be with us and deliver what is going to be a very, very fascinating subject. When the Chief Archivist, Rinda Patare, who will, you will all be seeing shortly, uh, mentioned this to me, I was very interested in this topic. For several reasons, forests are trees and trees are forests. And we have all seen what is happening to us in front of our very eyes to the forests that we have preserved for centuries. This is not just about timber trade. We've destroyed forests for things like the Metro rail line, so many things. And we have seen the devastation that the destruction of trees and landslides which follow thereafter, which have come across our path devastatingly, not in contained regions, not just in Maharashtra, but look what happened to Kerala. It was absolutely destroyed. The economy was destroyed, livelihoods were destroyed, lives were destroyed. And twice over, several years ago and recently in Uttarakhand. So what are we doing to our forests and what are we? what is the purpose of the timber industry in the long run? I don't wish to give a lecture myself, but I would like to introduce the speaker for this evening. Dr. Louisa Rodericks is the professor and head of the Department of History. Her area of interest and specialization is modern India, environmental history, urban history, genealogy, maritime and business history. She has to her credit major research projects from the K.R. Kama Oriental Institute in Mumbai, the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, Mumbai University, and the Exeter University in the UK for Gulf Studies. She has published several papers and research papers and articles in books and journals of national and international repute. Over and above, she is a recipient of many national awards in recognition of her contribution to research. She was awarded the Best Research Paper Award by the Indian History Congress, the P.S. Gupta Memorial and J.C. Ja Prize for, by the Indian History Congress, Modern Indian Section 3 in December 2013. She is also a recipient of the Samudra Manthan Award in 2016 in recognition of her research in maritime history organized by the Bhandarka Publications Group. Thank you, Louisa, for being with us today. She has published a seminal book recently on the development and deforestation making of urban Mumbai. It was that published by Primus in 2019. It's of a period of 1800 to 1878. She's of course well known for her research papers and book on Gujarat ornamental furniture, including the discussion on artisans, their techniques, their skills, and of course, global markets. But today, Dr. Louisa is going to speak to us on timber trade trajectory, the urbanization of Bombay and deforestation of Western India 19th century. Louisa, I must compliment you. Besides being a recognized PhD guide from the Ram Narayan Nduya Autonomous College and Mumbai University, and have guided successfully so many PhD students through their careers, where do you get the time to do the research? I certainly take my hat off and salute you for this. And today's paper, just a brief abstract of what she's going to speak about. So we are familiar with what's coming up this evening. 
Dr. Louisa Rodericks is going to discuss the natural resources of Western India, which were valuable in shaping the urban environment of Bombay, especially timber forests that were under territorial subjugation of the British, who eventually made it their prized commodity. I don't wish to say anything more except to thank Louisa from on behalf of all of us. We're looking forward to your presentation. And we couldn't do these presentations in these COVID pandemic lockdown times unless we had a super technical team led by Jason John, thank you. Yashraj, thank you. Rochelle, thank you. And Sanjana, you have been with us with more than over 40 webinars since lockdown. And we have approaching 52 weeks of lockdown. So thank you very much for supporting us in this invaluable contribution that you make to our webinars every week. So thank you everyone. And I hand you over to the speaker for this evening. And before that to Brinda Patari from Godridge Archives to give her introduction and welcome. Over to you, Brinda. Thank you, Dr. Feroza Godrej, and thank you everyone at the Museum Society of Mohi and CIN and CSMVS uh, for collaborating with us for this series of Thursday talks that we initiated uh, in this uh, pandemic year. So good evening, everyone. And before we proceed, let me quickly inform you about Godrej Archives. Uh, so conceived in 1997, uh, Godrej Archives was formally started in 2006. It is a corporate archive preserving the history of 123-year-old Godrej group of companies. And we archive histories of its product, manufacturing plants, and people. And we are making it available for research as well. To encourage research in business history, we have also started research fellowships and scholar-in-residence programs since 2018. And Godrej Archives works along with historians, writers, designers to reinvent the new meaning about the past and we strive to communicate this history through exhibitions, publications, art installations, and talks like these. So to continue this dialogue that we had started uh, in 2006 and reach out even during the pandemic, face-to-face -face interactions are impossible, we started this series of online Thursday talks in collaboration with the Museum Society and the CSMVS. And today I feel especially very honored to welcome Dr. Louisa Rodericks as a speaker for our fourth Thursday talk. And she has been my professor at Ram Narayan Ruya College when I was pursuing BA. And she was the one who actually kept me inspired about learning history throughout my student career. And today I'm really very pleased to again switch on that student mode as she would delve into the British policy that regulated timber trade and appropriated the forest, uh, which eventually actually adversely affected the forest and the timber merchants. So I'm really looking forward, Dr. Rodericks, and over to you. Thank you. Oh, very good. Good, uh, good evening to all. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Firoza Godrej for the generous introduction. Um, I'm extremely grateful to Godrej Archive, the chairperson, Dr. Firoza Godrej, and chairperson also of uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum Society of Mumbai, uh, the trustees, the executive committee, and uh, uh, Vrinda Pathare, my very dear student, uh, who is the chief archivist at uh, Godrej Archives, for giving me this, and the entire organizing team, the technical team, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present a paper which is so uh, on the topic which is so dear to my heart the timber trade tragedy urbanization of bombay and deforestation of western india in the 19th century so although historians in india have shown an increasing interest in environmental history in recent years there are very few works which seriously examine the root cause of deforestation my paper today provides an antidote to the existing historiography, historiography which barely takes into account the timber trade in the 19th century Western India. The major focus of my paper today is one of the main aspects of deforestation, uh, that a forest, that deforestation of Western India that was postulated in three phases as a result of physical infrastructure projects undertaken by the colonial British state. The paper introduced some fascinating vignettes regarding the vibrant timber trade, the trading networks, other trade-related features which led to infrastructural development of Bombay 
it also delves into the policy of the British towards forest resources like timber, their policy in regulating timber trade, appropriating the forest and establishment of the monopoly of forest and subsequently its impact on the forest. Now this study uh, argues for three particular effects of British colonialism on the forest in Western India. First, the colonizer, that is the British colonial state promoted an economic system that required intensive forest resource exploitation for infrastructure development like building ships, housing, civic construction, that is travelers, bungalows, bungalows within Bombay, and the, finally the establishment of the railways and extension of the railways in Bombay presidency and the furniture making industry. Secondly, you find it argues that the British built the knowledge system of the forest of India to forest service that is reconnaissance missions enabling them to monopolize, appropriate and exploit and reconstruct and transform the forest of Western India without any concern for the people, the local merchants and the tribal. And thirdly, it argues that the magnitude of deforestation uh, of Western India certainly increased as a result of the British rule. Now, I was fortunate to really come across uh, the very good primary sources from which was culled from the Maharashtra State Archives in the form of files and in the form of uh, the several uh, volumes in the Public Works Department, Railway, General Department, the Public Department, the Political Department, Revenue Department, and also uh, the marine department, especially when it comes to the maritime industry. And uh, not only that, uh, even the forest reports of the conservators were very much important to enable us to find out the perspectives you know, of the uh, British towards the forest policy. Yeah. Uh, so by 1800, what you see is Bombay emerged as an important port and a commercial center on the west coast of India under the British rule. Several infrastructural projects were undertaken by the state in the 19th century with the construction of the warship which began in 1800 and subsequently the other warships and commercial ships, public and private buildings, bungalows, furniture which adorned the houses of the elites, both the uh, Europeans, the British as well as the Indians, and the extension of the railways in the Bombay and erstwhile uh, Bombay presidency. Now, uh, timber was the most, became the most important commodity for these infrastructural development projects. Uh, a variety of timber was used, especially teak and other species of timber like blackwood, jackwood, babul, iron, irul, and many other such timber. And timber was drawn for namely by four states. That is Malabar, which is present day Kerala, Kanara, that is present day Karnataka, Gujarat, and Maharashtra, that is basically Basin and the Konkan region. So, the person, since timber became the most important commodity, the perception of the British colonial state towards the forest began to change radically in the 19th century and because it became the major asset of the company. Paradoxically, this urbanization process resulted in deforestation which took place in three phases and subsequently you see the decline also in this of this vibrant trade by the end of the 19th century. So next slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So be before beginning with the warships, that is in 1800, shipbuilding in Bombay had begun in the mid 18th century. Uh, this is also, you see, coincide with the decline of Surat and the rise of Bombay. Uh, since this was one of the most important industries from both commercial as well as from strategic point of view, you find ships came to be built of timber and uh, everything was constructed of, as I said, that was, uh, that's uh, how it was. And therefore the goal of the state was to gain uh, 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 control of the forest which resulted in the process of internal territorialization. Now, beginning in the 19th century. So internal territorialization is understood here as a political process of establishing control over the forest resources and behavior within the states to the articulation and enforcement of access and usage rights. 
so what is what it meant in practice was a progressive deepening and extension of knowledge of forest by conducting surveys and mapping the state gained access to these forests and control them at an increasingly local level but the, at the same time enhancing centralized management so realizing the importance of this maritime industry for both for commercial and strategic purpose lauji warrior you know parsis were known as good cabinet makers so you all know that parsis basically where they had settled in surat and they were good cabinet makers they were good furniture makers and therefore lauji and indians were also known for building ships it is not that the british who introduced shipping they were very well known for building ship tipu sultan had constructed also many ships so you find that in 1735 Lauji Wadia Nasirwanji Wadia was called to Bombay to construct the ships at the naval dockyard so you have the development of the naval dockyard Bombay is seen as a safer heaven here not only that you find it better than surat and you uh, what you see is also that uh, good for harbor and therefore you find lauji known for his craftsmanship nasirwanji wadia in ship building he utilizes his expertise european technology indian raw material that is timber and he built good ships during the 40 year tenure of master ships he built around 20 ships for the east india company and 14 merchant vessel most of them weighing 200 tons but these ships were small and uh, ranging with the guns of 6 to 10 guns so they were nearly not really big warships okay and uh, they were small ships so the next uh, uh, slide next slide yeah the turning point in the history of ship building comes in 1800 and this is there were two reasons for it one is uh, there was this fear of napoleon bonaparte invading india so the rise of napoleon bonaparte as a great ruler whose ambition was not only to conquer uh, to conquer the entire all parts of the world and he wanted to become the master of the world you find there was fear of this threat and the british uh, really wanted to build ships but the question was were they in a position in england to build the ships made of timber because oak was depleted in uh, england becoming being the mother of the industrial revolution uh, you find urbanization process begins much earlier and the oak is depleted and therefore there was no other alternative for the british but to depend upon the indian timber to construct construct ships for the navy so uh, this was the reason why you find that in 1300 a frigate so the next uh, next slide next slide yeah so this is what a frigate named convalis weighing 1363 tons with uh, 50 gun was built by jamshed ji bomen ji and launched by the british for the first time at the bombay dockyard the ship was so beautifully constructed and of such great strength that it was purchased by the admiralty and this warship set up precedent for building many other ships next next yeah so uh, you know uh, uh, indians knowing that how they had to undergo such racial insult so it was in inscribed it was constructed by dd black fellow 1800 uh, so uh, next slide next next yeah so this was the ship with they decide to construct the minden of 74 gun and to build such warship required quite a lot of timber so next slide so what strategies were adopted by the british in so next uh in extracting timber from the forest of west india next slide yeah so uh forests were of three types privately no go back go back private back so forests were of three types privately owned government forest and village community forest and certain areas of forest all the as uh, some village community had a uh, forest under their control now uh, the british certainly what they found was through their surveys reconnaissance mission which they carried out 
the good quality timber which was available and the straight timber which was required for ship building and such warship was in Malabar. In fact, they carried out experiments and uh, what you see is that when they carried out, they found out that Tipu Sultan ship can last for more than 100 years, which is not so which is ship which were constructed of oak. And therefore, certainly Malabar became the target of the, you know, to extract timber from this forest. Moreover, it was very sturdy, it was the density, it was good, and it was resistant to white ants. And therefore, you find the districts of Kerala, that is uh, the Malabar, and then the next district, that is the, the territory of Kerala, Kanara, that is Karnata, on the west coast of India, certainly became very important for the British. So what did the British do first? So they became a coveted property. Uh, uh, you know, they, it became uh, um, uh, a coveted property as far as the, uh, the timber is concerned from Malabar and in next is Karnataka, especially from Malabar. So first, what the strategy which was adopted was you find yeah, Malabar and Karnara was acquired by the British in March 1792 when a treaty was signed by uh, Tipu Sultan. And after acquiring these territories, the first thing that the British did, the next slide. Next slide. Yeah. They established sovereignty over Malabar. So even though the territory was taken over and the treaty was signed, you find the forest of Malabar and Kanara were brought under the Bombay government, okay, in 1808. And second thing what they did was, in 1806, the first conservator of forest was appointed. See, till 1847, there's no forest department. Forests were under political department, military department, revenue department. The British paid really scant attention to environment or forest for that matter. They, it was important, but scant attention to establish a department. So what they did at the most was appointed a conservator, that is Joseph Watson was appointed, and his role was to ensure that he conserved the trees, that nobody uh, flouts, you know, the, uh, the regulation which they passed in 1807, where they established the monopoly over tea. So and no, uh, they, literally this uh, proclamation annihilated the private trade. Nobody could indulge in the private trade. The British established the monopoly of the timber trade and anybody was caught, you know, in violating this uh, terms and caught of extracting timber, either by robbing or anything, the conservator had the right to punish it. So uh, that's how you find that uh, a variety of timber was, uh, just in, can you go back to the previous slide? So a variety of timber was required for different parts of the ship. If you see that generally the hard and sturdy woods were required. So you have these sturdy woods with the keel and heel, the base, you find hard and sturdy wood, which they could find it only from basically from Malabar. But the light wood which was required was required for the superstructure. So the next slide. Now forest uh, reconnaissance mission. Now, how did what uh, what did they do? So, as I mentioned, how territorial uh, uh, how you find the forest territory becomes very important. How surveys become important, the knowledge become important. So, we talk about archives today, but British were able to maintain this uh, sophisticated way. They may be able to create the archives of the trees existing in the entire part of the Western India, the forest of Western India, archiving it, making use of it for infrastructure development in Bombay. So thus begins the reconnaissance mission, okay, which were conducted, no, earlier, uh, which were, uh, yeah, okay, fine. Forest reconnaissance mission, which was conducted uh, in different parts of Western India. Uh, they began with the Malabar forest, and uh, if you see, uh, uh, can you take up the next slide? Next slide. Yeah. So that's how you find the surveys were carried out in Malabar. These were the forests which were explored in different regions, Karnataka, Gujarat, as well as you find even uh, the Konkan and the Basin region. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Now the British decided to classify the timber, like which 
because ultimately the good quality timber was required for the straight timber, especially for the ship, the base of the ship. So you find the first sort was a superior quality timber, which was 40 feet in length and eight candies could be procured from one particular tree. And this was the tree which grew to the uh, 860 to 100 years, almost 100, uh, you can say 120 years. Second sort was 30 feet in length and 3.3 and a half candies could be procured. And these were the trees which could be cut for uh, as far as 25 to 60 years. These trees were that, that particular year. And the third sort was 15 feet in length which was one to two and a half uh, candies could be procured. And these were younger trees, one to 25 year. Next. Now, since all the timber could not be procured from the Malabar region, other regions also, as I mentioned earlier. Now, this is how the archive that was created. They, it gives you minute, the reports which were submitted uh, and uh, who conducted the surveys, basically the military people, the engineers who went into the forest. And uh, it was not very easy task, you know, going into the dense jungles. Of course, they equipped themselves well. And although it was a little easy as far as Malabar and Tanara forest, but it was not so very easy when it came to Gujarat forest. So uh, as far as the Gujarat forest is concerned, uh, they had the difficulty in going in the Dang region, which was dominated by the uh, uh, Beals. And in the first, uh, what can say their journey, the British were killed. So uh, as usual, the British, how diplomatic they were, they made use of, they appealed, approached the Gaikwad ruler and he provided some local inhabitants. And that's how they succeeded in, you know, uh, getting into lease agreement from Khandesh as far as uh, even the Beel tribes of supplying the uh, timber to the company. So, um, uh, yeah. So you have, uh, uh, these were the, this is how the archive was created. As I said, of the statistical data is given, which timber trees are fit to cut, which are not to fit to cut. So this is how the timber districts of Malabar. Uh, yeah, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so this is the teak trees. You are, as I mentioned later on, you'll, I'll talk with the blackwood tree also, which was used next. Next. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting to know that the collector of Bombay had collected, uh, carried out a survey of the trees in Salset in 1810. And one can really see that, uh, uh, that uh, you have these trees like uh, in Thane, uh, you have uh, 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 this the first sort, second sort, third sort, these many trees were available in Godbandar. You have these many trees available. Malad, which, which I come from, had 2,143s. Marol had, so Marol, which includes even the RA today. So that's why the trees, number of trees are more. Uh, and that's only lungs of Mumbai, I feel, which survives today. So we can't afford to lose RA at all. So 9,424 trees. And that's how you have the total number of trees were around 10,322, 32 trees, as far as uh, uh, the third sort, first sort, and second sort. Next. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, what were the how? Uh, now I'll take over to uh, take you to as far as the trans-regional uh, timber trade in Bombay. That is Bombay, Malabar, Bombay, Karnataka, Bombay, Gujarat, Basin, and Konkan. So, after obtaining the data about this valuable timber, the company advertised in newspapers, and uh, they invited tenders. Uh, for the same, describing the size of the ship and a detailed description about the quantity and quality of timber required for the marine. And so thereafter, the company entered into a contract with the merchants, whichever tenders were low or in the favorable terms. But for larger consignment of timber, the British government used the so-called European agency houses like Bruce, Fawcett and Company, Forbes and Company, who becomes a vital link between the, 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 the government and the timber merchant. But nobody could fell a tree, nobody could uh, uh, you know, go into the forest without the permission of 
the East India Company. So that's how the license, the East India Company had, they had to, any contractor who wanted to indulge into this trade, any timber merchant, they had to take a permission, they had to obtain a license. And that's how the East India Company maintained their monopoly rights as far as the timber is concerned. So the system that was, uh, that they adopted was the contract system. So contract system becomes the modus operandi for the construction, for the extraction of the trees uh, or the forest in Western India. And then the contractor, after obtaining license, purchase the right to fell the tree of the forest from the government uh, and then obtain the permit for the same from the owner and hire people to cut the tree. So when he hired the people to cut the tree, he paid one rupee per tree. Uh, the selection of wood was the primary preoccupation of the contractor who had to supply seasoned timber. So what do you mean by seasoned timber? You have, once the timber is, uh, trees are cut, it had to, you know, walk, it had to uh, dry it up. So it took some months, sometimes years to dry it up. And then it was dragged by the laborers from the forest, if it was the interior of the forest, to the rivers. And then it was floated down the river to the sea coast and exported to Bombay, usually in the month of uh, December, January or February. Okay. And uh, now if you see that, uh, uh, the uh, next slide, the transportation. See, in Malabar and Kanara, uh, Kanara, that is Karnataka, that is elephants were used. And why elephants were used? Basically, because uh, labor was very exp expensive. Uh, imagine a straight timber and such a log of wood, you know, to be transported from the jungles required many people. So uh, uh, elephants were uh, any day better to transport this timber. And when it comes to, uh, in the northern region, you find timber from Basin, Kalyan, and Bivandi, they were brought through Thana River to Bombay. And there you find the main transportation was basically bullock carts. So in Gujarat, you find bullock carts, ox, oxen were used to transport the timber from the jungle. Uh, and then the rivers plays an important role. As you know that the only mode of transportation that was available was through sea and the ships. Okay, the shipbuilding had begun. And so the watilas were used, the ships were used to transport this particular cinema. So rivers become very important. In Malabar, it was the Bepur River and uh, you find Kaveri River. In Northern region, uh, you find it was brought to the Thane River. And uh, uh, that's how you find transportation uh, was done. Yeah, next. So uh, most of the demands of the dockyard were met basically from the Malaba coast. Uh, in the year 1799 itself, 10,000 teak trees were brought down from the uh, Bepur River, which was the produce of several years, which enabled the construction of this particular ship in 1800, the Cornwallis. And then you find timber was sent to the sawmills and then converted into planks. So if you see the prices of timber in the period, uh, in the early 19th century, the Bombay government was supplied with timber. Malabar, uh, the teak, which was the most superior and good quality, it was 14 to 16 rupees per candy, uh, Calicut timber, it was called the Calicut timber the, of the first sort. For the second sort, it was 12, 10 to 12 rupees. And the third sort was 10 to nine to 10 rupees and uh, the timber plank costed around 30 rupees. Now uh, the British, uh, uh, you find that they were able to uh, build these ships uh, and you find uh, bringing from Nasirwanji uh, Wadia. And if you see between 1810 to 1820, 13 vessels were built. But even before building the ships, the British in order to establish a firm monopoly, you have uh, in course of time, the British, in, in order to annihilate the private trade, you he they gave the colonial state gave the monopoly right to one person. Imagine, Chakura uh, Musa was was the leading merchant of the Malabar coast, and he took advantage of the situation, and it was his duty to see to it that timber uh, was supplied to the East India uh, to the uh, Bombay dockyard. So you find that, uh, uh, of course, this did 
affect the merchants, the tribal people, the, uh, it did affect uh, the local people also because uh, it affected the merchants, especially of the coastal and uh, it annihilated their trade because now it was one person who was dominating the trade. So you find merchants, you know, objecting to it in the form of petition to establish trade to it. Uh, so you find, as I mentioned, to Malaba for you see annually, beginning of the 19th century, 1600 to 2000, almost 1600 to 2000 candies were supplied annually to the company in the early 19th century. So you can imagine the extent of timber and from the advertisement, you know, it, I could make, a, I calculated that to build one timber, one ship, warship, as such, it required 936 timber trees were cut. So you can imagine the extent of deforestation as a result of building ships, especially the wash ships. Uh, yeah. Next. Next. So the next infrastructural pro, uh, project was public buildings, housing, bungalows, furniture making industry, uh, which took a toll of forest. So uh, uh, if shipbuilding consumed the quantity, enormous quantity of timber, the civic construction in the early 19th strength, uh, century greatly contributed to the denudation of forest of Western India. Urbanization of Bombay was greatly linked to the timber resources of Western India. Once again, the eye was on teak. Teak became one of the most important component in the construction of houses, bungalows, and public buildings, in travelers' bungalows, and so on, in, Mal in Malabar, as well as also in the periphery. Okay, so in Hill Station, Mahabalipuram Hill Station, and so on. And uh, uh, despite of the fact in the early 19th century, in 1803, there is a, a great fire you find, and the town committees established to persuade the people not to construct uh, houses of timber, yet houses came to be constructed. In the early 19th century, you also see uh, the buildings, which were public buildings. You have the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, uh, which was constructed in 1833, the rebuilding, uh, that is rebuilding of Min, the commissariat building. There were many buildings also which were constructed. And another important uh, as, uh, is what that by 1800, the most of the public uh, building, you know, they had this um, revenue department building, marine department building, and so on. So all these buildings were in a dilapidated state, so which required urgent repairs. So repairs also took a toll on the forest of Western India, you find. So most of the uh, trees which were, uh, most of the, uh, uh, so annual repairs the building, the construction of building, and the next slide. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is how I managed to get the, from the archives. This is the, uh, you know, plan for the bell. Yeah, next, Kavi. So this is one of the most important industry which was established in the 19th century, the carved furniture and the sadeli that is inlaid work. Now, if you see this carved, next, uh, next slide. Wood carving, next slide. Yeah, so wood carving industry uh, wood carving in Bombay was an imported industry because with the decline on Surat, you find merchants uh, and as well as also the carpenters began to migrate to Bombay. So most of the per people who were employed in this industry were from Ahmedabad and Surat who had migrated to Bombay. And there were several workshops producing this furniture which was located in Bombay, that is around the Meadow Street in Bombay, the area popularly known as the Angres Bazaar. Due to the English shops in the vicinity, a variety of furniture was made of blackwood, jackwood, and teak. And, were, and the, the types of furniture which was manufactured were chairs, bed, couches, wardrobe, desk, cabinets. So uh, 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 next. Uh, now, these are the prices of the blackwood furniture in the mid 19th century. And why I'm talking about the mid 19th century and how this, so you, uh, uh, the furniture industry, uh, it's basically catering the, to the local clientele, the rich, the elites, uh, the most of them are Parsis, the Gujaratis, 
Mangaldas Natubai and the others, they decorated their houses uh, with this carved furniture. And by 1851, the first international exhibition was held in um, uh, England. Uh, uh, and, and this international exhibition where they had to display the crafts, so it was a crafts exhibition. And certainly when it comes to crafts, India was known for its beautiful crafts. So craft furniture was displayed, Sadeli was displayed, and believe me, in no time, in no time, in two, that time the exhibitions used to go in for months. And in no time, in just in a two days time, all this carved furniture which was displayed were all sold off. So you see the transnational trade, it's a ocean, oceanic trade which is taking place, place all over the world. So local knowledge and the global market you find. And because of the market which increased, you see that the, uh, the demand for this Blackwood furniture was so much that Lockwood did forest from America. So there were many uh, foreign visitors. So you have American, the French, the Asians, all visiting uh, the exhibitions. And uh, they were so enamored by this Blackwood furniture that Lockwood Day Forest, uh, when he gets married, you know, he becomes, he sets up a company in Gujarat with, uh, in collaboration with Hatti Singh, the, the Blackwood, uh, 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 that is the carving industry. And he becomes an agent to supply the furniture to, uh, America, in fact, one of the richest man in uh, uh, in New York, uh, constructed his house made of teak as well as car, uh, decorated his houses with this furniture, and he was able to he was able to amass a lot of wealth. So when he got married, Lockwood Day Forest, he comes to India for his honeymoon with his wife, and he visits all these crafts, and he's so enamored by this, especially Blackwood furniture. That uh, where you see that since the rise of Bombay, the decline of Surat. So you see the revival of this Blackwood furniture industry also in uh, uh, in Surat and Ahmedabad. And in Ahmedabad, he sets up this company. And not only that, so if you see the next slide, uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, even the Sultan of Zanzibar, okay, no, no, before this. The Sultan of Zanzibar also came to Bombay and he took purchase the sofa. If you have seen my earlier slide, yeah, uh, uh, he was uh, he came to Bombay and he bought the uh, particular sofa in 1860 or so and took it to Zanzibar. So this furniture went global, not only to America, to Britain, to France, but to Sri Lanka, to the Arab world, and everywhere to Zanzibar and so on. So that was uh, 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 the. So you can. I'm just linking up to how you can see the pressure on the blackwood trees which were being cut because uh, you find companies being set up later on and uh, the uh, roaring business being made as far as this Bombay box, it was called handsome boxes. And suddenly was another thing which was like uh, the inlaid work, which was introduced in Bombay and uh, by the Multan uh, artisans. And uh, they are the decorated type of boxes. So there were so many masters and a 75 apprenticeship in Bombay and a variety of articles were prepared. Next. So uh, the civic construction and shipbuilding, both commercial ships, uh, which was commercial passengers or maybe for the warships, uh, you find uh, certainly postulated the first phase of deforestation. You have the years between 1807 to 1823 marked the high point in companies' monopoly in timber for shipbuilding and civic construction. So the imagine the impact, the immediate impact of this was extraction of timber from the forest of Malabar, Karnataka, Travancore, Konkan, Gujarat, which led to the denudation of forests, especially those mushroomed around the riverbank terrains were more vulnerable to such gratuitous plucking. So we come to the next, uh, that is uh, phase of deforestation, that is the end of the timber monopoly. So as I mentioned that the policies of the government certainly had affected the merchants, the traders, the people. So with the fear of social unrest, not only the fear of social unrest, also we did, this is the period where the British officials are under the influence of the French physiocrats, physiocrats who talks about the free trade, Adam Smith free trade, the more the free trade, the better is the profit. And so you find they abolished the post of the conservator of the forest 
and that's how the monopoly ends but the end of monopoly led to more devastation of the forest of malaba and kanara there was unrestricted felling uh, encouraged by the timber agency which made large age, uh, advances to native contractors to provide timber uh, and this finally led to severe uh, uh, famine virtually in timber next slide uh, next slide so uh, this is what i got from the archive that before the statistical figures that if you see uh, year see 1807 the timber that was supplied was to the tune of rupees 31124 by the time it is 1823 at the end it is 108000 but after 1823 the abolition of timber this is the statistical figure you get it's 174000 then 2 lakh 4 lakh 4 lakh and it went on increasing of course the uh, the uh, the another reason also is since river was very important for transporting so many a time due to famines and due to failure of monsoons many a time they were not able to navigate this particular timber to bombay and the prices also escalated next next yeah and so you to see is that since timber it's it's a demand and supply theory so since the timber became less and less and less if you you, you see the statistical figure which shows that in 1856 the superior quality timber was 18 in 1836 37 20 and 1837 38 it increased to 27 and the same thing happened with the plants the first sort 40 45 55 so you can this indicates the extent of what can say the deforestation of western india next next yeah so uh, uh so you uh, you find that even before the establishment of the railways yeah uh, back back please even before the establishment of the railways uh you find that after the end of the timber monopoly you find uh the uh, it uh, with this privatization of trade led to more felling of the trees as such and uh, what you see is that uh, the scientist as well as the superintendent of botanical gardens and all they kept on informing the government that it's high time that we need to regulate the forest we need to come up with some measures to uh, conservation measures to conserve the forest otherwise we will fall short of timber and then we'll have to import the timber which will be far more expensive but uh, it really fell on deaf ears which was only in 1847 the british uh, somehow uh, manages then to establish the pioneering department that is 1847 where alexander gibson becomes the uh, the uh, the superintendent and the forest department conservator okay so he become the conservator of the bombay presidency department but once again the british is not british the government is not ready to spend enough money on the development uh, on this department the number of personnel that he has are very few so you can imagine the role of the conservator is now to supply timber but at the same time to conserve the forest and so it's a dubious role which he had to manage and balance between the two and therefore you find the conservation program to begin with but due to paucity of time not able to go into it um uh, i will talk about the last phase of deforestation that is establishment and extension of the railway in bombay and bombay presidency so by the mid of the 18th century uh, 19th century those ships uh, you find uh, had top contra ships were uh, were made of iron because uh, due to the scarcity of timber jahangir one of the uh, descendant of lauji was sent to england he stayed there for 3 years to learn how ship should be manufactured of iron and believe me in 1840 the first steam ship that is the iron ship was constructed uh, by uh, by the parsi builders in bombay so although ship was constructed of iron but it did not stop deforestation because you see that it's the beginning of the railways and it is basically because of the building building of the railways which uh, dalauzi uh, uh, lord dalauzi had justified in his minute the need for commercial as well as from strategic point of view and especially after the revolt of 1857 the british really hurried in the extension of the railway so what you see is that 
uh, the uh, uh, the railways because the railways started the british now changes their policy when it comes to annual repairs of the building they stop the repairs of the building by 1850 and now their whole attention is on the railway construction so when it comes to railway construction next slide uh, next slide now two companies play a very important role in the construction of the railway the great indian peninsula railway and the bombay baroda central indian railway company um, in the bombay presidency which began in the mid 19th century in 1853 the first railway line was laid between bombay to thana in 18 53 uh, of two, uh, 22 and quarter miles so uh, so what you see is that a vicious cycle of exploitation okay where history repeats itself with every new development that occurred, occurred in the urban city so now it was the railway and the whole process again repeats the contract system the service to be carried out okay so so you have now it is uh, again the contract system only the only the uh, bombay baroda uh, central indian railway company they had a departmental system so different between the contract and the departmental system is the contractors themselves were the ones who supplied timber for the gip but in the departmental system it is the engineers became the contractor that is the only difference but uh, it took a toll on the forest of western india so now they began to target uh, the british had realized there is not enough timber but railways are equally important so what do they do so once again in fact there is a debate you know there is a big debate among the colonial officials as to uh, whether it should be iron or whether it should be uh, timber and what they found was timber is any day cheaper it is though it is not so durable like the iron but the iron that they had to import it the cost would increase so it's the cost factor certainly went in the favor of timber so they thought we could manage to go into the forest deeper into the forest of malabar and you know get this straight timber from malabar and then target the other regions which were not targeted so far so you find that uh, a contract system was a contract was signed uh, by the directors of the east india company and uh, gip but uh, they found that uh, the not enough timber so it was there so you find that uh, that's the reason why you find that every month when the railways they began to construct the railways every month the timber prices were increasing so earlier it was in years and now it was in months so you, if you see the railway line between bombay to thana in 1853 of 22 and quarter miles 64000 sleepers were required uh, comprising of i now it was not just teak but it was blackwood now blackwood is little hard to work on but they found so james burke who is the chief resident engineer he went to the forest gibson goes into the forest and they again prepare the archive you know for furnishing the details to the authorities about the timber availability so that's how you find the blackwood uh, 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 were used for uh, the main line sleepers and irul was used for siding and station sleepers so this is the statistics which i uh, get uh, by clergon who is the forester of a uh, uh, conservator of uh, uh, madras forest uh, you find that kerala forest is uh, uh, he gave this particular description as if seven sleep sleepers could be procured from one tree approximately you find 9142 teak irul and blackwood trees were cut for single railway line between bombay to thana so you can imagine the extent of deforestation okay the way the trees were cut here as such next slide next slide yeah so this is the prices of timber every month the timber prices are increasing from 3 and a half to 3.8 to 7 to 8 to 9 and so on so unprecedented demand for timber escalated the prices okay and uh, next i'll almost coming to a close yeah so this is the extent of the railway company you find uh, how gip company they built the railway so you can imagine so many miles and so much of timber that was cut okay next so this was uh, uh, to be completed but because of the shortage sometimes of uh, the timber they were not able to complete they were got delayed for that matter so uh, 
uh, by the time the BBCI, that is the Bombay Baroda Central Income, started constructing the railway in the Bombay Presidency in 1856, okay, the GIP had already consumed much of the wooden sleep, uh, uh, sleepers, okay, so timber was used basically, they decided for sleepers and for fuel, okay, so there was a huge shortage of good quality timber for the sleepers, and therefore you find, next slide, they had to delay, next slide, yeah. So you find that uh, both the companies trying to extract timber finally led to timber famine. And it so happened that uh, uh, they were, the BBCI in 1860 had to, had was compelled to use the imported sleepers from England. There was no other alternative. In fact, earlier when they had tried, even when it comes to shipbuilding, and later on, even for um, uh, before they had conducted also a debate on iron or wood sleepers, they carried out an experiments of the timber from England, and they experimented with Indian teeth, and all the uh, timber from England was eaten up, okay, by the white ant which was not so with uh, uh, the teak of India. So that's how the teak, in fact, the teak of Malabar was considered to be the best even compared to the Burma teak. Okay. And it so happened that because of the shortage of machine, find was compared to use iron plot sleepers on the railway line between Pune, Solapur in the Thalgat to Busawal in Khandesh. And not only that, timber had to be imported even from Australia and Singapore. This was because, you know, and you have so many merchants entering into this lucrative because the trade became very lucrative. So many Hindus, the uh, Muslim merchants, the Parsis were the main who were all involved into this uh, trade because it became a lucrative practice uh, of uh, uh, trade. Uh, it fetched a lot of money. So the price of, and many a times these contractors, you know, they cut very small trees also because it fetched a lot of money for them for ultimately so the price of teak imagine what it began was 6.8 per candy now it ready uh, it increased to almost double by the time it is 1860s and therefore in 1860s large quantity of timber was also sleepers were imported from malayan peninsula so you have first in the inland trade the you have the interregional trade uh, and then you have the transnational, the global trade where you have the importation of these timber sleepers as such. And then they realized that the best thing is to have the iron railway wagon instead of wooden wagon. So they made suggestions were made and finally it was accepted because there was no really timber. 1864, but whatever timber was available, they were procured all from young trees. So many a time there are lots of reports, you know, which talks about, about how the timber which is used is not of a very good quality leading to accidents and the timber being rotten. So timber, just not timber for sleepers, but also uh, the uh, repairs also re put a heavy demand on the, because it would last for 10 to 15 years. And after that, again, the sleepers had to be replaced. Okay, so the next. Next slide. So, uh, a last part of it that is fuel consumption. I won't go much into detail because of paucity of time. Approximately, well, no, one, one slide before this. Approximately, uh, one slide before this. 1,50,000 to 2 lakh tons of fuel was consumed annually by the railways in form of fuel which amounted to 40 to 60 rupees per ton leading to fuel crisis. So sleepers led to timber crisis, and then you have the fuel crisis in the 1850s itself. And you have the locomotive superintendent, you know, uh, he estimated in 1860 that they had only plantations of 800 to 900 acres. So how are we going to affect the, get the fuel? So you can imagine now with such strict regulation where the people are not able to have access to the forest as such, and they themselves were not getting timber, that is a fuel, uh, basically the bubble and the jungle wood, especially even to cook their food. So certainly you find it had its repercussion, not only on the people and the merchants, but also on the forest. And this is this, it is for this reason you find it is this pressure that you are not able to get timber that 
the British decided now the change policy. So how environmental factor plays an important role in bringing about a change in the economic system, in bringing about a change in economic policies, in bringing about the policies towards the forest. So all the time, Gibson was the conservator kept on telling, instead of administering the forest, what needs to be done is regulating the forest. And that's how you find the 1865 Act coming to place. So where they banned on felling timber from the government wasteland where accessed or not accessed without permission, nobody could uh, you know, have access to this particular land. And it led to the this act. So the first time you find you have Bombay Forest Department in 1847, 56 says uh, uh, in uh, Malabar. And you have the all India level, it is the Imperial Forest Department where Dietrich Bandis, who became the Inspector, Inspector General of Forest of India. So he was in Burma and that's why he was called here. So what happens is the British were not trained forester. They employed, they did not employ trained for There is lack of scientific forestry. Last, next, last. This. So the lack of scientific forestry and therefore it is not surprising that Brandis, who is from Germany, is invited Okay, he was in Burma, he's invited to regenerate the forest of Western India. And you find Brandis makes it very clear that we need to have a better regulation, we need to have a better act. And therefore, the 1878 is the major comprehensive legislation of forests which divides the forest into reserve forest, the protective forest, the village forest. So, but by and large, there was actual no demarcation. All the forests were totally brought under control. But credit is given to Brandis for regenerating the forest. I was able to have a very good map, uh, you know, which shows the uh, the afforestation and reclothing of the forest of entire India. So, to conclude, I'll just conclude that. British colonial state fueled the imperative need for concluding, for building ships, warships, civic construction, establishment and extension of the railway in Bombay and Bombay Presidency. What you see is extension of the British power and centralization of geographical knowledge of Western India. It enabled the colonial state to maintain imperial communication, intra-trade, trans-oceanic trade and naval defense. So ultimately, it accounted for British maritime and imperial strength, which depended upon the Indian wooden sailing vessels built of plants, beans, mass sawn from suitable trees of Western India at the Bombay dockyard. Uh, so ultimately, what you see today is the, you see the urbanization process of Bombay at the cost of deforestation. So you have urbanization on one hand, but at the real cost of deforestation. So uh, I would just a short note that environmental crisis today has become a matter of great concern. Uh, in the wake of natural disaster, we have recently witnessed, as Dr. Filoza Godred mentioned, at Uttarakhand. So we have disasters not only in India, but globally. And so when we look at ecological crisis from historical stance, there is so much to learn. We can avoid mistakes of the predecessors and improve, strategize, and guide future reform efforts. In this sense, what we feel is uh, we have been, in the post-colonial period, we have been far more brutal than the British government. We have integrated forests with economic development goals, strategies, and progress. So we are following the same footsteps. And today, with uh, we have so much of construction activity. Where is the world? Where is the forest? Even the forest, when it comes to uh, the RA forest, that also is, uh, we don't know still now whether it will be targeted or not. Thank you very much for patient listening.